So before we go on, uh, you see on the screen, tonight is a very special night for me because I am going to present to you um, my mother's life story, my family's life story. So this is very, very personal to me um, because as you've seen uh, in our videos, my mother was the greatest inspiration to me in my life from the time I was a child. She taught me Yiddish. That was the first language my parents spoke to me, my mamaloshin. We were not religious. We didn't go to temple. It wasn't about religion. It was about culture, saving the culture that Hitler tried to destroy. And my parents went on to become very active in the Jewish community. My father was the chairman of the board of the YIVO organization in New York back in the 80s. He was very active in the Jewish community. He was a survivor of Auschwitz. And my mother, as you will learn tonight, um, was born in Siberia, um, but ended up becoming one of the most uh, important forces for Yiddish language and culture in the world, 25 year professor of Yiddish at Columbia University, 35 year journalist writing in Yiddish for the Forward newspaper, an award winning playwright and an author um, of several books. Um, and tonight uh, we are going to explore her memoir called A Breed Apart by Professor Miriam Hoffman reflections of a young refugee, a miraculous escape from Russia, from DP camp to Columbia University and beyond. This book is actually dedicated to my grandfather, who you now see on the screen, Chaim Shmulevich, all of us Sholem. Uh, he should only uh, have uh, rest in peace and have a beautiful, we say in Yiddish, Zolerob malichtiken ganeden. May he have a beautiful and bright Garden of Eden. My grandfather was also a writer and a satirist and a humorist, and his writing actually graced a Yiddish newspaper in Munich, Germany, called Unser Weg, Our Way. And that was between the years 1946 and 1949. And so for the rest of the evening, I will be the voice of my mother as she tells you the story of her life. I was born in three installments, the first being in the Siberian town of Tobolsk on June 26, 1936, where my father was incarcerated on trumped up charges of espionage. There, I was granted my first birth certificate. Now, when I was the tender age of one week old, my father was released from prison and he was given permission to return to the same slave labor camp, Slavuta, in the Ural Mountains, where he had been previously arrested as a rabble rouser. We arrived in the slave labor camp where rumor had it that I had just been born. And so I was granted my second birth certificate. My third birth certificate occurred in 1947 after the war when I was 11 years old and we were stationed in the American zone in the DP camp, displaced persons refugee camp named Hindenburg Kaserne in Ulm, Germany. That same year, that same year, the American embassy in Germany notified parents that their children would be denied entry into the United States since they were born under Soviet rule. It was the time of McCarthyism and the communist scare. With the help of the Joint Distribution Committee, it took no time for these children, including me, to be provided with a third birth certificate stating that we had actually been born in Poland before the Russian occupation. Chapter four, Tola, my mother. My mother, Tole Bronya 
Tilche Breindl Neuhaus, was one of four siblings. Her father, Yide Zandl, was a glazier and a weaver. And he agreed with Karl Marx that religion is the opium of the masses. And so he banned anything that dealt with religion and tradition in our house. My maternal grandmother, Ruchel, was a tubercular woman, submissive and subservient to her husband. When word reached her that her husband, my grandfather, was having an affair with another woman, she asked three of her children to snoop around and follow him. And they returned with the bitter news that the rumor was true. And so Ruchel urged the children to escape their father's wrath and make their way to the Soviet Union, where life after the revolution, she reasoned, must be beautiful, free, and vibrant and in search of young and skillful workers. And this is how my mother's older sister, Nache, and 18 year old brother, Avrom, wound up the first ones in the family to become victims of the gulag, the penal system of the USSR, which consisted of a network of labor camps from time to time they were handed postcards to write home, describing how wonderful life was in the Soviet Union. It enticed my mother to follow their venture, and two years later, she was off to the land of Oz. Chapter seven, lost in the quagmire of the Soviet Union. When my father was released for the umpteenth time from the prison in Saratov, he was invited by the NKVD, that's the secret police in Russia, to meet in a neighboring park. And there an agent instructed him, now that you are free, your task is to inform on the Jews who secretly frequent a hidden synagogue. All we want from you is to know who they are and where they are and what their names are. And if you don't comply, you will go back to prison. Now my father knew full well that all the synagogues had been shut down. And so his answer was swift. I am not a religious man, he said. I don't pray and I don't frequent synagogues. Well, then you show up in their secret prayer houses or basements and pretend that you are religious. You can arrest me again and again but I don't know any religious Jews, said my self-righteous father. And he was arrested again and again, although his conscience was clear. Others did comply under the strain uh, because perhaps their lives were at stake. Once in prison, my father was handed a document, a pre-written confession to sign. He refused and he suffered the consequences. He was beaten and he was confined to a cell. He was fed salty herring and he was deprived of water. Chapter 10 my mother's quirky brainstorm. Now, what you may ask was the nature of the relationship between my mother and Stalin. And the answer is that both of them made use of the same railway tracks, he on his way to the Kremlin and she on her way to the Gulag. Now this intimate kinship was not to be lightly dismissed because in fact, this grisly old man with the thick and alarming mustache was attempting to convince half the people of the world that he was actually the benevolent father of a nation. And following his own line of reasoning, didn't that 
inadvertently make my mother his daughter? <laughs> but what did he have against her? Nothing. So why the gulag? Though busily engaged in the distribution of hell on earth, Stalin didn't fail to provide for my mother. Oh yes, he had guaranteed her a fair share of jails and labor camps, starvation and misery. And this combination of catastrophes might have continued indefinitely were it not for my mother's determination. She declared unequivocally that such tactics would not work with her. On the contrary, she would teach that father of the nation that you don't fool around with Tolya, Bronya, Neuhaus, Shmulevich, Yida, Zavlev, Novna. Chapter 11. My mother's letter to the grand old executioner. Now, when push came to shove, my mother didn't hesitate. She rolled up her sleeves, took her pen in hand, and she showed Stalin what she was made of. And it seems that my mother was a hotshot with the pen. And so she deluged his excellency, comrade Stalin, with her correspondence. Her approach was unique and all her letters often began with an elaborate salutation. Most exalted father of the nation, who has assured humanity of fairness and justice and freedom and who has sacrificed himself for the working class, put them on their feet and made of them what they are today. Believe me, they will remember it as long as they live. Loyal protector of the persecuted and the pursuer, guardian of the masses, our faithful redeemer from the yoke of capitalism. How can I recount your greatness and accomplishments? There is none, none whom to compare you within the annals of the human race. One can only be left speechless by your achievements. Who is there to sing your praises? You are one of a kind, unique in the entire universe. However, you have provided for everyone, but you have forgotten me, me and my innocent husband who is rotting in the jails constantly for absolutely no reason whatsoever. You have forgotten also about my tiny little girl who lies ailing in a dark cellar and doesn't see the light of day. Why do I deserve all this, oh dear father of the nations? You must arrange for my husband's speedy release and provide us with a decent home of our own. I know full well how busy you are. Your plate is full, what with Smolensk and, and, and Stalingrad. Nevertheless, I don't see how you can be indifferent to my plight. And I realize also that you consider some matters to be of greater priorities, but I will not stop writing to you until you pay attention to my quandary. As soon as I finish this letter, I am going to sit myself down and write a second and a third letter, and I won't rest until you respond. Send my warmest regards to everyone in the Kremlin, your loyal citizen, Tole Bronye Neuhaus Shmulevich Yide Zavlevnovna. Time passed with no response forthcoming. But my mother didn't give up that easily. As dependable as the sun rose, each morning she dispatched her daily letters to the father of the nation. And one bright morning, a letter arrived from the highest 
Soviet authority, namely the Kremlin. Dear Madam Tole Bronye Neuhaus Shmulevich Yide Zavlevnovna, we have taken your daily letters into consideration and have decided to investigate this entire matter. In the meantime, we will re-examine the charges against your blameless husband and provide you with a home. Show this letter to the chief of police in your district and you will get the key to your new habitat located on Astrachansia Ulitsa, number 27 in the city of Sarato. And remember, you are living in the land of freedom and justice where Yosef Vissarionovich Stalin himself provides for every citizen personally. We are doing this by his kind benevolence with this one provision. Stop writing letters because the father of the nation has a weak nervous system. I cannot describe in my own words the great happiness that must certainly have pervaded our freezing cold basement that day, for I was too young to preserve all the memories of that occasion. When my mother, however, was reminded of this particular day, she would swell with pride. A short time later, my father was released once again. And as soon as my father was out of prison, we caught the tram, we rode to the district headquarters and with a police escort, we went off to get the first look at our new one room abode. Chapter 16. My mother and I escaped first, lodged landing, oh, and what a landing. My mother decided on the spot that come hell or high water, that we were leaving Russia and taking the train bound for Poland. Within several hours, we were in Lodz, my mother's birthplace. It was a cold and dreary autumn day. Our train lurched to a stop and suddenly we were confronted by a mob of red army soldiers. They descended on us through the doors and through the windows like locusts. Some of them settled on the roof of the train, but there were so many of them that my mother and I were unable to get off. The soldiers were crowding the train cabins without regard to who got hurt. There was a great commotion, pushing and pulling. Luggage and bags were thrown in and picked up and the soldiers were smoking and drinking vodka. The train was about to return to Russia when my mother began to holler hysterically, which awakened some of the sleepy soldiers, let us out of here, let us out. Now, one of the soldiers who was busy loading his suitcase in the overhead compartment, he, he took pity on us. He opened the train window and he shouted to the soldiers who were standing on the platform below, hey, buddy, grab, catch. And then he picked up my little mother by the coat collar and he threw her out of the window. I came next. He grabbed me, shouting out to the soldiers standing alongside the railway tracks, here's another one, catch! And out I flew. And if that wasn't enough, he also threw out my little pillow and I had a little bundle of dried toast. And that is how we landed in Lodz, Poland, at the very end of the war. 
Our new housing complex was situated on Yakuba Street, number 16 in Lodz. And it was said that during the war, this complex had actually served as the Lodz ghetto. Chapter 18, Hindenburg Kaserne. In 1946, having walked from Poland for what seemed like an eternity, we finally reached the city of Ulm on the Danube River in the American zone. Our displaced persons camp, Hindenburg Kaserne, was situated on the city's outskirts. And during the war, our camp had served as a Nazi military installation and an airplane base. And I would like to go off script for just a moment to tell you a little bit about the, um, about the caravan, shall we call it, who all the refugees after the war who were trying to escape whether it was from Russia or Poland or Eastern European countries, um, they walked in a caravan, thousands. My mother was just a little girl. There were women, pregnant women who gave birth during the walk um, and many people died on that walk and they walked from Poland through Austria and into Germany when they finally ended up what you're looking at right now, which is Hindenburg Kaserne in Ulm, uh, Germany. Um, it's tragic that even today we deal with caravans of people escaping persecution. Hindenburg Kaserne became a DP camp right after Hitler's demise in 1945. The camp consisted of half a dozen dreary, crude, four-story barracks and one airplane installation. Ulm was the city that gave birth to the renowned physicist, Dr. Albert Einstein. But at that time, there was no trace of his ever having been their native son. Now, all of the official camp positions were filled by fair elections and help came from several organizations, among them the IRO, the International Refugee Organization. Now, the founding statute of the IRO defines a displaced person, a DP, as one who, as a result of acts of brutality, racism, bigotry, and atrocities is uprooted from their homeland or permanent dwelling place, or as an individual who is forced into slave labor, or one who, as a result of religious or political discrimination, is driven out of their permanent dwelling place. Without the help of the IRO in the American zone of Germany, we all would have faced great hardship trying to survive the long journey to nowhere. There were several organizations that came to our aid knowing full well that the refugees, we refugees were helpless, homeless, and victims of a great tragedy. Chapter 20. One of the many songs we sang in the camp. As a young teen, I kept a journal where I wrote down every song we sang in the camp in four languages, Russian, Polish, Yiddish, and Hebrew. Included were love songs, patriotic songs, Holocaust songs, tragic songs, and happy songs. I also illustrated every page of my album with colorful crayons that were sent to us by American children in care packages. And I brought the entire album with me to America in 1949. I was no doubt the only child in all of the DP camps after the war 
that not only kept a record of every song we sang, but managed to bring that journal to America. And today a copy of that album with its songs and drawings is located and stored in the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Um, and again, I'm going to digress for just a moment to talk about the legacy of my mother and my grandfather. Um, indeed, this album, this journal of songs that my mother kept um, is extraordinary. It's a very important ethnomusicology document because it has folk songs from that period that were sung in the DP camps. And one of the performers in our festival uh, is Efim Chorni and his wife, Susanna Gergus. He and I met in Romania and he is a, uh, an expert on ethnomusicology and folk music from Eastern Europe. And he looked at my mother's journal and he was able to recognize songs and he's a singer and a klezmer musician. And he sang for me for 45 minutes. He sang many of the songs that are in this album and we're hoping to turn it into uh, perhaps a Broadway musical as well as use it as an archive and academic material for uh, the University of Miami and maybe other schools that teach music and folk music and especially Yiddish uh, uh, songs. Um, in any event, my grandfather was given an album. He was the vice president of the survivors committee, the directors committee of the camp, the Jewish camp. And so he was given an album of photographs that was dedicated to him specifically. I've only found one other like it in the whole world and it is part of the Mendel and Miriam Hoffman archive. Um, you'll see my mother is actually right there in this corner. I think she's in every one of these pictures um, or certainly some of them. Um, this is an album that is extremely important to understand how the refugees who had just survived the Holocaust, how were they able to come back to life? This is my grandfather, the vice president of the Lager Komitet, the camp committee, Chaim Shmulevich. Um, and in the album, we see all the different ways that the refugees were able to basically come back to life. Um, chapter 31, my piano lessons in camp. My father's new brainstorm was to hang up a notice on the camp bulletin board that read, enrich your children's lives with a musical education, we will provide the piano teacher. And early one morning, a tall, middle-aged, hungry looking German appeared at our doorstep. He bowed courteously to my mother, spoke to her in German and concluded the terms of his wages. After each lesson, he was to receive one kilo of American noodles. There was no mention of money. The Germans of course were devastated at that time, having lost the war, their positions, and their former life. He was very condescending, and he didn't even look at me as if I was completely irrelevant. I instantly understood that it was a major humiliation for him to sink so low as to have to teach music to a Jewish child. It appeared However, that the German stomach played its own compelling overture in sync with its underfed conductor. And thus began my musical education. Somewhere on the road between life and death, the children of the war lost their ability to dream. And so we lived for the day and we gave no heed to the future. Playing the piano became a necessity for me. 
I found solace in the music, an inkling of a more pleasant world where one could hope to achieve the yearnings of one's heart because music reverberated with, with inspiration, enthusiasm, gentleness, wonder, love, fire, and passion. The following winter was a very harsh one. And although my fingers froze, I would not forgo my music lessons. And so I put on a pair of warm gloves, I cut off the tips of the gloves and I went on playing. The German ground his teeth and slapped both sides of his head and he cursed loudly every time I played a false note, although he knew full well that the piano hammers were frozen and I had to struggle to get any kind of sound out of them. I could hardly grasp the extent of his hatred. Nevertheless, I kept on repeating those few bars of music that I had learned in that short period of time, aware that a child of refugees had no right to expect such a luxury as playing piano. Chapter 42, America, the Beautiful. After spending four years in the DP camp as refugees in limbo, we finally boarded an American military boat called the General Hersey from Bremenhaven in Germany. I was just a young girl and I was looking forward to the journey and a new life in America. We were surrounded by a multitude of anxious refugees just like us. At the start of the journey, I became seriously seasick, but the infirmary was crowded. My mother carried me to the deck so I could catch my breath instead of languishing on the lowest level of the boat. And after a while, she became hysterical with worry. Father cornered the ship's doctor and he grabbed him by the throat. If my child does not survive this trip, your life will be in peril. And the doctor relented and he made room for me in the ship's infirmary. And they began pumping intravenous fluids into me. Later, I learned that the only other patients in that infirmary included the doctor's wife and his relatives. Luckily, I recovered. And two weeks later, our boat finally anchored in Boston Harbor at the end of 1949. Now to me, the words, words like Kalamazoo and Timbuktu had exactly the same meaning as the word Boston. But once on shore, I suddenly felt pangs of hunger. Now, our entire possessions consisted of two ragged suitcases, the clothes on our backs, and five dollars. My father left my mother to guard the suitcases on land, and we set out to walk along the streets of Boston and a delectable smell enticed us to the open door of a tavern. And there we came across trays of frankfurters, sauerkraut and mustard. Now, not knowing one word of English, I pointed to the trays and I said, dos, dos, un dos. And apparently the hot dog vendor knew exactly what I meant. <laughs> father, was concerned about not having enough money. And so he bought only one hot dog for his hungry little girl. And for the first time in my life, I ate a hot dog with mustard and sauerkraut. It was Gun Aden, paradise. I vividly remember those newly discovered delicious flavors. And my father and mother were so elated to know that I had finally eaten something. 
Now, from the docks, we were taken by the Jewish agency to the Boston train station, where we boarded the train headed for New York City. And we were in such a state of anxiety that we didn't even take notice of anything around us. We were led from place to place in a confusing labyrinth of streets and alleyways, crowds and odors. America. Chapter 46. We found each other and the new dress. It was in Wilton Junior High School that I met my best friend, Feigale. We could communicate in our mother tongue, in Yiddish, and I still knew no English when in seventh grade, my class had to take an IQ test. Now, of course, I and all the other Yiddish speaking students all failed miserably. And in turn, we were classified at the time as retarded and we were relegated to a bench in the back of the class. And once that rep reputation had been acquired, we were expected to achieve nothing. And as time passed, Feigele and I talked about shoes and dresses and hats and purses, necklaces and earrings. I mean, that's what the two of us craved. And when I approached my mother for a new dress, and she heard that it would cost $7, you would think that the sky was about to fall. But dance, we must. And so somehow I managed to wrangle out of my mother $7, and I bought a blue flowery dress with a fitted waist and no sleeves. And it fit me as though I had been poured into it. Now I wound up having two dresses while Feigele had none. And so I deliberated with myself and I decided that I wanted Feigele to be the first one to wear my new blue dress and I would wear my old dress in which I was as comfortable as a fish in water. Now the question was how to manage it without my mother's knowledge. So we racked our brains until we came up with a solution. I would put the new blue dress into a brown paper bag and throw it out the window. And Feigele would catch it and go back behind the staircase of my house, take off her old dress, stuff it into the mailbox after she put on the new dress. And to our joy, it fit her like a glove too. That evening, our plan was carried out to perfection. And off we went to the Diplomat Hotel in Manhattan. And when we reached the hall, it was already jumping with young people, most of them the offspring of Holocaust survivors. A photographer appeared on the scene and he snapped our pictures in a variety of poses. Not only had everything proceeded without a hitch, but Feigele was pleased with her cavalier gentleman, my old DP camp friend, Munyale, the man who eventually became her husband. After the dance, she reversed the process and the blue dress wound up hanging innocently in my closet as if it had, it had been there all along. But then came chapter two of this saga. The photos from the fantastic dance eventually arrived. My mother and I gazed at them. Feigele and I were two beauties and the two handsome young men sat alongside us smiling. My mother was ecstatic until suddenly a blood curdling scream pierced the air in our kitchen. Everything turned black before our eyes. Mother had finally caught on. Tell me, Mirale, the dress that Feigele is wearing looks to me exactly like your new blue dress. What is it doing on Feigele? I know already your tricks, Mirale. Remember, you will pay for this lie. Hell will freeze over before you weasel any more money out of me for anything ever again. Today, Feigele lives 
on Fifth Avenue. And she owns a wardrobe designed exclusively for her. Half a century has gone by during which we have worn out thousands of dresses, danced at hundreds of affairs, but the taste of that long gone evening lingers, ever fixed in our memories with this warning. Don't forget where you come from. Chapter 54, Further Reflections, Deciphering Historical Moments. We Jews are a people who are a breed apart from the rest of the so-called civilized world. We have endured in times of adversity and retained our tenacity, our courage, and our determination in the face of enormous loss and suffering. We are also a people with a history of building, destroying, and rebuilding our own historical and cultural heritage. To illustrate, I will uh, tell you about a time that we moved into our home in Israel. Our neighbor came by to greet us with a bouquet of multicolored flowers. Bruchim habayim, welcome. Now you can start being an Israeli and stop being a Jew. You see, our history does not start with the Holocaust, nor with the establishment of the Jewish state. Today, we are on the periphery of the obliteration of our own cultural and historic past. At stake is our very Jewish heritage. The soul of a people rests within its language and language is culture. Now, since we moved back to the United States, I have dedicated my life and career to the preservation of the Yiddish language and the Jewish culture. And through a century of assimilation and neglect, the rich Yiddish language and culture was abandoned by the very powers that should have celebrated it. But cultural Jewish life is not lost. What is lost are the six million slaughtered Jews whose unborn future generations will forever deprive us of their contributions to Jewish life, culture, and world civilization. Had those six million Jews been allowed to live and thrive by now, there would have been over a hundred million Jews. Among them are now lost scholars, professors, rabbis, doctors, artists, and so on. You see, the world has not changed. I see the same brutality and inhumanity that I describe in this book continue. The news from Vladimir Putin's Russia seems eerily consistent with my tales of Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union. The slave labor camps of North Korea are still functioning to enslave innocent victims, just as the Siberian Gulag did in my lifetime. The crematorium in modern day Syria performed the same function as Hitler's multitude of gas chambers and their accompanying furnaces. Nazis still march in America. And anti-Semitism, hatred, prejudice, and extremism are still prevalent, not only in America, but it, over the entire world, and the world remains silent. 
I have been an educator all my life. And I leave you with this question. When will we ever learn? I hope that our future generations will explore, seek out and discover their Jewish roots and continue their own remarkable historical journey and legacy. Thank you. A Breed Apart by Professor Miriam Hoffman. Um, you can actually purchase A Breed Apart, not only on Amazon, but also on our website, whyilovejewish.org, where you'll also find many other uh, wonderful pieces of merchandise, including Yaakov Heller's artwork and my mother's other books. Um, so I hope you uh, enjoyed our little get together this, uh, this evening. Mm -hmm.